Welcome Classic Rock fans to an episode of New Album Review and today we're looking at the new Pearl Jam record. If you like my musings on music please click like, subscribe and click that bell so you get notified of any future uploads. And for other ways of supporting my channel please check out my Patreon. I first saw Eddie Vedder on MTV I think way back in the 90s growling into his microphone bristling with rage and resentment. I remember him, his, his vocal style moaning and mewing like he had a mouthful of mushy peas. He sounded absolutely fabulous. Now, of course, you know, I remember, as we all did, I, I remember shooting out and buying the 10 album as, as if my neighbours weren't already pissed enough with me. However, you know, of course, now we've got this new one 30 years later, I believe, and it's, it was interesting for me to kind of think about how this might sound. Uh, especially, all that, especially after all that rage and fury of, of youth may have chilled a little bit like a post-coital beverage. But I must admit I was taken aback at how vibrant they still sound. Uh, and this record sort of simmers with indigna middle-age indignation. Their ire aimed at the orange man, of course, and warnings of impending environmental catastrophe. Pearl Jam, I think, were quite different from their grunge contemporaries, if I may say that. I think we're a Soundgarden and uh, Nirvana were drawing from that well of metal and punk influences. I thought Pearl Jam were a lot more melodic, drawing their sort of sonic textures from bands like The Who and The Doors and Led Zeppelin, of course. And this allowed for much more experimentation with sound. And even their recent albums, although the critics have dismissed them as often being meandering and bloated, they've been a fascinating listen nonetheless. I read in Rolling Stone magazine an interview with Roger Daltrey where he says he manages to keep my generation sounding fresh by channeling the anger expressed in the song. Indeed, I mean, of course, you know, it's a similar sentiment, of course, it's been expressed by John Lydon. And it seems that Vedder has ripped a phlegm drenched page out of that particular book on this one. Consequently, it makes Gigaton an enthralling and emotive listen. One of the focuses on this album, of course, is the Trump presidency, which, which has it boiling with rage. We, we treat it to these projectile invectives of righteous indignation. A kind of ire that we experienced all those years ago with songs like Jeremy, of course. American politics is described by Vedder on this album as a tragedy of errors. I was listening to this uh, album this morning. I got it as a, an MP3 download from Amazon. I've not actually got the physical copy yet. But I, I made a few notes about some of the tracks as I, I was listening, if you'll indulge me. I love the muscular and anthemic sounding Quick Escape. It sort of announces itself in a series of groans and creaks. It's quite eerie sounding because uh, before Vedder uh, begins describing the track as a journey to find a place that Trump hasn't fucked up yet. Seven O'Clock is a, an, an, another lovely song with these swirling textures and, uh, of sound. It's a remarkable listen. Uh, he refers to Crazy Horse, I think at one point, uh, not Neil Young's stage fellows, of course, but the, uh, the, the famous Indian chief, as well as Sitting Bull, before referring to Donald Trump as Sitting Bullshit. But there are quite a few uh, Republican baiting diatribes on, on this record. Uh, I don't know what your politics are, but uh, whether or not you'll find that a bit irksome or interesting, I suppose that depends on you. One thing the albums certainly do is it highlights the disharmony and discontent that there is for many within the modern political status quo. We're not, of course, given an actual seat at the presidential table, but we are. We do get to witness as voyeurs the feeding frenzy. Never Destination has some great riffage to it, and of course the song River Cross is, uh, has a gospel feel to it, using the, the river as kind of a well-furrowed metaphor for a meandering journey. It's a wonderful song with Eddie Vedder's baritone warblings accompanied with that pump organ, which gives it a solemnity. It's a solemn, it has a solemn dirge-like quality, essentially about loss. But it's not all doom and gloom on this record. There are some sparks of defiance and optimism. In fact, I detected in uh, whoever said, as I, I wrote that it was a mantra for the light at the end of the tunnel, I think he sings in this one, Who, whoever said it's all been said gave up on satisfaction. This album is full of crunching guitars and spit, which very much sets the tone for this record. I love the track Dance of the Clairvoyance, the, uh, the bass at the start of this track, it's fabulous, has a distinctive Talking Heads vibe to it. Take the Long Way sounds like a, a bit of a homage to Soundgarden, I don't know if I've got that right, perhaps a tribute to uh, Chris Cornell. Then we get the very grungy, some might even say grunge pastiche of Super Blood Wolf Moon. I love the way this record is structured. We get the harder, more abrasive numbers on one side. Then we get the more meditative numbers on the flip side. Rolling Stone magazine has said quite brilliantly that it's almost as if the band are exhaling. Certainly the environmental catastrophe is a theme on this record. You can almost hear Greta Thunberg cheering from the wings. 
uh, environmental catastrophe and global warming it is referenced um, in the lyrics for example uh, seven seas are rising forever futures fading out or oceans rising with the waves it's a, a lot of vitriol of course it's not all most of it of course aimed at the orange fellow certainly the theme of this record is our world is in trouble represented by the flat line on the album cover and although this record is politically charged it doesn't get too preachy it doesn't suffer from what i call a dose of the bonos instead we agreed to, um, instead of a lot of wind and piss from middle-aged rock stars we were actually greeted with a a slab of grown-up introspection I think this record will appeal to a lot of people. It sounds dynamic. It's infused with emotion. Uh, and sonically, it's interesting as well. In fact, Spin Magazine have said that it um, describes as 70s hard rock swagger uh, blended with West Coast progressivism. And that, of course, brings me to the next point. The sound and production on this record is fabulous. In fact, I found this little bit of information from a fan who had posted in a forum online. I don't know who it is, uh, but he says, or she says, the production is stellar, it's huge, it melts all over you, it's layered but not over polished. Ed sounds great, raspy and powerful. The overall production is different, unique and rewarding. Bang on, I think. There's no doubt that this record is sandwiched between a sense of existential dread and combative defiance. And as one rather waggish critic has pointed out, it's not so much the times they are changing, rather than the times they are terrifying. But he's absolutely right, of course. This record seizes the zeitgeist. Uh, as Kerrang! magazine puts it eloquently, it, you know, we get the sweet caress of reason being applied to a world that has become a blur of untruth and fear. I have to say that this band still sounds fabulous, dynamic, politically and aesthetically relevant. Uh, Vedder still sounds like he's got a mouthful of mushy peas as far as I'm concerned. His trademark mewling and moaning is all over this one. But then that wonderful voice adds to the, the aesthetic dynamics of Pearl Jam in my opinion. Anyway, after giving this album a run through this morning, I would encourage you to go and give it a listen. You've been watching an episode of New Album Review. Thank you for watching. Click like, subscribe, check out the Facebook page. But more importantly, please do keep listening.